Hi, friends, and welcome back to We're Already Here. I just wrapped up my interview with Aaron, where we discussed eating disorders and disordered eating. One thing I really want to put up front is I don't want anyone to discount this episode because you're like, well, I don't have an eating disorder and I don't know anyone who does, so this is not relevant for me. Statistically, you almost definitely do know someone with an eating disorder. One in every four people will struggle with disordered eating at some point in their life. One in every four. That means if you know more than four people, you statistically know someone who has struggled with an eating disorder at some point in their life. So this conversation is relevant to everyone. We talk about how to bring up the conversation with someone who you think might be struggling with an eating disorder and resources that you can look at too. So I just wanted to share some stats about eating disorders to set the scene and also just share why this conversation that I'm having with Erin is something that I feel is really important. Over 10 million men and women suffer from a clinically significant eating disorder at some point in their life. Around 50% of adolescent girls engage in crash dieting, fasting, self-induced vomiting, and diet pills. Every hour, someone dies of an eating disorder or eating disorder-related ailment. Fewer than 25% of people with an eating disorder receive care. Eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of all mental health disorders, surpassed only by opiate use disorder. 81% of survey 10-year-olds are afraid of being fat, and 40 to 60% of elementary school girls ages 6 to 12 are concerned about their weight or about becoming too fat. I think this is really important. I hope you listen in. I loved my conversation with Erin. I had been following her for a while. So enjoy. Hi, friends, and welcome back to We're Already Here. Today, I am here with Erin Ryland. Erin is a certified disordered eating, anxiety, trauma, and mental health coach. Through her work as a coach, as well as a breathwork facilitator and NLP practitioner, she helps women overcome their struggles with food, anxiety, and past trauma to live a purposeful life with lasting recovery. Erin herself suffered from an eating disorder for 20 years before recovering and then pursuing her calling to help other women. Now through her coaching business, In Body Love Coaching, she's able to do just that through one-on-one -on -one coaching. Erin's mission is to spread awareness and give support to women and guide them to a place of love and acceptance of themselves. She lives in Northern California with her 12-year-old son and pit bull, Lucy. So today we are talking all about disordered eating, eating disorders, and overall just Erin's work. Erin, I am so honored that you're joining me today. I am so excited. I followed you on Instagram for such a long time. So oh. this is so exciting to me. Yay. I know I'm excited too. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and your work? Yeah, I struggled with my eating disorder from 15 to 35. And it was a life in and out of treatment centers. And recovery was so not linear for me. And it took a really long time, a really long time. When I did recover, I did know, like I really, really knew deep in my soul that I wanted to do something else. Mm -hmm. So I, I left my job in academia, left the nine to five job and mm -hmm. decided to go into the realm of coaching. And so that's kind of how I got into the coaching realm for eating disorders and trauma and, you know, all yeah. that comes with mental health. So it was, it was a decision that was hard because I didn't know what was going to happen. It was like totally mm -hmm. a leap of faith. Oh, totally. And, and at 35 to just pick up and change your career. 35 is still very young, but I feel like there's all this pressure once you pass your twenties that, but, well, this is what you're doing now. So, <laughs> right? Like you're here. And I could have, for sure, I had a great job. Mm -hmm. Great job. But 
I knew it just wasn't going to, I didn't want to spend the next 30 for however long doing it. So mm -hmm. I took like a few years to get the, you know, different programs and all the different things that I felt I needed on the actual kind of root and getting, I knew I'd been through it and mm -hmm. I'd gotten, you know, and so I knew what worked and I knew it was just basically like, I wanted the extra base. Totally. Yeah. So I, that's when I was like, okay, now that I have that and I have the, the kind of psychology behind it, I could start helping other women and people. Mm -hmm. I like to refer to that as a toolkit. Um, so that, that's, that's what I like to say in therapy too. Like when I, uh, whenever I've gotten a new therapist and they're like, okay, so what are you looking for? I'm like, I am looking for a toolkit. Like I have been through hard things. I've overcome the hard things, but sometimes it's like, you get through it and you look back and you're like, man, that was hard. I got through it. But like, you don't actually know tactically how you did. And there's a difference between getting through it and then getting to the end and actually being better because of it or just not letting it fester inside of you. So I, I love everything you're saying. Sometimes you just need the, the, the tools beyond mm -hmm. just going through it. So funny you say toolkit because I have a toolkit. We actually made toolkits um, sometimes in treatment. Mm -hmm. like what can you use when things are hard? And mm -hmm. we actually have a physical tool box kit or whatever and have different things in there for when we were struggling or when things were triggering us. And so I use that as well. Whatever you have in that toolkit, you use to kind of recenter, reground and get to that place where you're not using behaviors. Yeah. In a few questions, I want to get back to this toolkit mm -hmm. idea and, and hear a little bit more about what is actually like an example of what would be in the toolkit. But just to level set for everyone in this conversation, what is an eating disorder or disordered eating? So I like to say eating disorders and disordered eating, they technically can be interchanged on some levels because if you have disordered eating, it's how I see it. It's anything where it's taking away from your life, food, exercise, eating disorders is kind of, you know, the, the term everyone hears, you know, the, mm -hmm. I'm an eating disorder and, you know, mm -hmm. the diagnostic criteria and that goes along with insurance and stuff like that. But there are so many types of quote eating disorders, but it's also, you may not fit into the box or the check marks of quote, how someone's diagnosed with an eating disorder. And there's many, many types, subtypes. That's why it's so layered mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. someone may not quote fit, fit the box of, sure. well, I don't have this, but I have this. And I just say, if you are not happy, if there are, if it's something where you're obsessing or you're starting to see like, because some people don't even realize it. Yeah, especially growing up, seeing the pop culture of like the 90s and the early 2000s, it was everywhere. So is it, am I on a diet or is this disordered eating? I love how clearly you phrase that where if it's impacting your life and it's obsessive, am I getting that right? Yeah, if it's impacting your life where you are thinking about it all the time or you won't go out to dinner with people because, oh my gosh, I have to eat or I don't want to eat too much, whatever it is. And it's like, mm, maybe that's something to look at. That's a horrible feeling yeah, to not want to sure. go out and eat or, or things like that. So it's, it's yeah. the head space. So what are eating disorders rooted in? Why do some people struggle with an eating disorder or disordered eating and others don't? It's so complicated. So what I've learned, seen, understood over the years is, you know, eating disorders are not a choice. It's mm -hmm. not like sometimes people are like, oh, you know, and there's still that, that, uh, I don't want to say stigma or it's mm -hmm. like the stigma of like, oh, you have an eating disorder. Or why are you thin? Are you the anorexic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. People think that. Yeah. And it's really, really hard because, you know, these aren't choices. There is some sort of self-worth and you keep pulling back the layers trauma is a lot of times and when I say trauma it's 
could be anything that has affected you. So trauma mm -hmm. doesn't have to be this horrible, horrible thing, but it can be. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's trauma based. A lot of it is sports based. It's mm -hmm. it comes from you know gymnastics or swimming things that, you know in that niche where you're in you know, your body seen ice skating. These are just generalizations, but mm -hmm. it, it's rooted in that. And, and what I can personally say for me was yeah. it was started in, in trauma, and so it was the way I saw life. Yeah, was in this different lens, and so a lot of times trauma is kind of the root like yeah. a low sense of self. It's yeah. the worthlessness that mm -hmm. someone can feel. Uh, the reason I asked you that question was in part selfishly, because that's something I always wonder. And you see like, so some people in the same households uh, grew up in the same households and yet one does it and one doesn't. And it was something even as little as like the starting of looking at the calories, the fat grams and genetics is part of it or the type A personalities are higher of having the eating disorder along with other things. So mm -hmm. if you started looking at that early on, it triggered that. And then that's where it can start. Your brain is still so young. And so when it starts that, it is an obsession. And then it, it's all that you can think of when you live life like that for so many years, it's kind of, um, it compounds everything, everything. Sure. So what do you think people get wrong about eating disorders? That it's a choice or vanity or something that you can just get over. I, I think a lot of times what's so hard is healing recovery is not linear. Yes, there's an actual food part, but like I said, it can be the underlying stuff. When you start obsessing about something, it's like you can't stop. And I get it. It was, Aaron, you've been in so many treatment centers. How are you relapsing again? How? Why? Mm -hmm. And it was so hard for people to understand. You're super lucky because I was to get so much treatment and mm -hmm. get that treatment. But it, I would relapse and a lot of people didn't understand why. So I couldn't stop. And, and it wasn't because I didn't want to. Right. I hadn't worked on the stuff underneath. So I think that people think, well, if you've had treatment, aren't you over this yet? Or your, your mental case, you must be really messed up. Yeah. And it, that, okay. That does not help. <laughs> right. Or one but, thing I heard you know, a lot was like, why well, just eat? Like, why can't you just eat? Like it's literally yeah. just eating. And I don't think people understand the mental block. One analogy I would use to help people understand it's like when you're on a diving board and you know the water's cold and you want to jump off the diving board right but your body physically can't and yeah. you can't jump off and it's like just jump like just jump off the diving board yeah. and your body feels stuck to jump yeah. that that's that's what it's like <laughs> it's 100 percent is it's like yeah exactly I, I just think that it's very hard to understand why someone if they get treatment or why, why won't you just eat? Or why can't, if there's people that are overeaters and their friends, family know that they're overeaters, it's like, well, then just go on a diet. And I'm, yeah. that does not help. That, that does must not be help. so hard. I empathize so much with people who struggle with disordered eating on that side, because not only do you have like the really awful internal dialogue, but also you're hearing it from everyone else telling you to lose weight. I can't imagine how difficult that is. Our society really values thin bodies. So yeah. you almost get, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because when you have the disordered eating on the under eating side of the spectrum, yeah. it's like you're getting the societal validation too. Yeah. So that might almost be worse, but I can't imagine the struggle of beating yourself up internally every day and also hearing it from everyone else. Yeah. That sounds like hell. The sad thing is, is that a lot of times when there's someone that's super thin and they're in treatment, it's like, oh, I get it. I get it. She's, you know, anorexic. And then there's someone that's overweight and they're like, and that it was, it, I felt really horrible for in luckily binge eating disorder is now a, like an actual disorder. People are getting help more in the last five years, 10 years. 
because of before no one no one gave them that help that they needed and so i in the you know when i was in treatment there was a few people with binge eating disorder and they were just as sick emotionally and physically as someone who was dying of being underweight it didn't matter totally so it was it was and it was hard for them i know it was for sure i'm sure yeah what should we do if anyone listening has a loved one who they think might have an eating disorder how how can we open that conversation respectfully with someone yeah so that is super super hard and i uh luckily you know mine wasn't like that i mean i got put in at 15 so i didn't have to my parents didn't have to like ask it was like yeah it was like bye Aaron. and and so there wasn't that having to try to mm-hmm. talk like there is plenty of people and clients i've had you know family members i work with the the family because they know that their their daughter has an eating disorder and mm-hmm. how exactly how do i even go there with them because oh, yeah. it's touchy super touchy it's more of starting you can start the conversation even simple things like is there something going on and the the problem is is with an eating disorder it's going to be like nope nope everything's fine there's so much shame behind it there's yeah, so much and it's shame. like no and it's also leave me alone i want my eating disorder go to the NIDA website, National Eating Disorder. It's like, I love them association. They oh, are, yeah. NIDA is they great. Are amazing. I love and, their, I love their content. It's their website. So good. Their social media. So good. Yeah. 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 I, I highly recommend. Yeah. And that's what I've, because each person's individual and I don't want to be like, say this, say this, say this. It's more like go to this website. They literally have step-by-step things depending on the type of eating disorder or the age of the person uh just the the whole entire spectrum of eating disorders and what the best way for that person may be to go in and talk to their loved one because it can send the person either way they Mm -hmm. may be that's all they need is that opening hey i've noticed like what's going on and that sometimes that the person that's all they needed to be able to just start talking Mm -hmm. and I've I've had that too where the person just wanted someone to notice almost Mm -hmm. but couldn't stop and so someone just saying hey like is something going on or hey uh I've noticed and you know the the person best you know so they know okay I can't say that yeah and then it opens up all the communication there's like no one way because mm, it's so it's so hard it's yeah that's what makes eating disorders so hard that i don't think people understand as well i know and then also because it's where do i get them help how do i get them help because it is also very hard to navigate treatment places therapists everything mm-hmm. and so at least on the the NIDA website, or if you even just Google like eating search for whatever state you're in or whatever uh, location, then Mm -hmm. they give you lists of resources. So Mm -hmm. that's been like, it's really helpful. It's not all inclusive, obviously, but it gives you a better place to start to see, okay, where, where can we even go to start like getting the person help or even the person themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier about having a toolkit. What are some examples of things that would be in that toolkit for someone struggling with an eating disorder? So I keep the example, even of my toolkit, mine was like, if I wanted to go, like, it depends on what the, the trigger is. It could be anything, actually. It's anything that like, upsets you or you see that you're starting to obsess or mine would be like weighing myself like mm-hmm. a lot a lot and mm-hmm. I had different scales and when I was recovering and I still wasn't ready to throw out my scale mm-hmm. but I was working on for me working on not weighing myself like however many times a day so yeah. when I would feel that 
like pulled or like, go, it, I was like, okay, take a step back. I said, I would take a step back, mm-hmm. give myself five minutes. Cause usually that urge that, that impulse to do whatever it is at that moment will subside. So in my toolbox, it was pens and coloring, anything artistic stuff, like stickers, like things that I could make collages with that really like took me out of my head or phone numbers of Mm -hmm. people I knew I could call. That way I didn't have to think about it. It could be if someone wants their their Bible that they can reach to in the time of that panic. Breaking the, the habit. Yeah. And usually... You know, it's just the initial, oh my gosh, I have to A, B, C, D, or I'm going to go do A, B, C, D. And it's just taking that even five minutes to come back, stop. Most of the time that urge is lessened and at least you start lessening. Because even if I were to be like, okay, I'm going to do just five minutes of this. Mm -hmm. Even if I went to go weigh myself after it's starting the practice of stopping that impulse to want to do it. Mm-hmm. I always say like, okay, even guys, guys is my clients. Okay. guys, yeah. even, even if you end up doing whatever, even if you're going to go binge on whatever you feel like you have to go, it, it's okay, but let's just work on stopping or, you know, breaking that initial urge that that feeling like you have to right now Mm -hmm. or if something upsets you and you're going to go do whatever I found the more and more you do that it's like breaking these little impulses to use a disorder to cope yeah yeah and I think I, I I like I like how you mentioned this toolkit can include a whole array of things for some people it's a bible for you it was a lot of artsy things Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for people to know anyone can be struggling with an eating disorder. You don't have to be underweight or overweight. No. It's not just about body image. It's not just about food. Yeah. Men can have eating disorders. Yeah, men do. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And I read s- somewhere that second to opiate addiction, eating disorders are the most deadly mental illness. More people die of an eating disorder than any other mental illness. Every hour someone dies as a direct result of an eating disorder. So this is, it's prevalent. It's out there. Mind blowing when you say it, right? Like every hour, every hour, every 60 minutes, someone will die from an eating disorder or the related causes. Now that could be taking their own life because of the eating, you know, with the eating sort of being the main thing, it could be the malnutrition, not getting the help they needed. It is literally the leading in this country. And that is the sad part is that it's not, it's so hard to even get treatment insurance companies. It's so expensive. And yet it's it, the high psychiatric disorder. It's right there at the top. And yet it's almost not even seen. Yeah. It's like, that That's challenging. It's very challenging. It's very, very, it's frustrating. <laughs> Aaron, I saw that you have a post comparing letting go of an eating disorder to letting go of toxic relationships and situations. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I always try to bring my my own experience and how, and then I've seen the patterns that this is not just me, like who have this. And so when you're letting go of this eating disorder, and I say it's my it was my best friend and my worst enemy. Mm-hmm. And yet I couldn't, I just couldn't you know, let it go. And so I'd have these toxic relationships that kind of mimicked my eating disorder. It was like the good and the bad. There was no in between. Mm-hmm. And so I was either, I was always trying to fix the problem, fix me. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Uh, you know, with relationships and like toxic people, I like almost attracted them to me. Mm. And 
I started realizing that once I let go or I began to recover, the toxic friendships, the ones that were not good, I was able to finally start seeing like, that's a really bad relationship. Wow. And, you know, I even, after my last treatment center, I had to, I, my fiance and I, I was with for like four years, that ended and that ended because I started seeing that that relationship was super toxic, super uh, just unhealthy. And as much as I like wanted to be in this, you know, fairy tale of a, you know, yeah. a image in my mind, it was letting go of that as well. Mm -hmm. And that was so, so hard, so hard. Yeah. But when you do that, you start seeing, when you start recovering and doing all that, you start seeing clearly things that may be really, really horrible of, of just keeping yourself down, your self-worth. So as my self-worth, um, I began to even recognize I was an okay person. Yeah. That I liked myself. I was like, I do not like you. <laughs> like, <laughs> you are not a good person. Yeah. You just needed the yeah. validation less. Yeah. And, and I, it's always, it was that outside validation. So it was ex, I always say things. It was trying to get external validation, external safety, mm -hmm. a sense of safety, the external wants for an internal issue. Mm. And so when you work on the internal, it starts, you, you start seeing the external things that you thought were what was everything or keeping you there. It's really not. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you end up filling those needs for yourself instead of looking for them outside of yourself. Yeah. And we're all human. You know, human beings, like we want to interact. We want to be, but when you start seeing like, you're okay, you're okay without someone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So the last question I have for you before we get into the last three questions that we ask for everyone on the podcast, what is breath work and how does it support the work that you do with your coaching clients? I love breath work. <laughs> I, love breath. I love breath work. I came into breath work like uh, four, three or four years ago and I had heard about it kind of like, oh, is it meditation? What, huh? you know, you kind of hear about it. And so I got into a, a really good program to do it. And I mean, when I commit to something and I do something, I go all in. So it was like a seven I'm with you. Program. I do the same thing. That's why right? I have this podcast. I was like, yeah. it is not enough to talk about this with everyone I know at every party I go to. I need the entire world to hear it. So I'm with you. <laughs> right. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to just Google or like look on YouTube. And so, so it basically is using breath to release any stagnant energy past things in your body because your body does hold the score. There's that book, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and your body does hold on to everything. So even if you work through your stuff, I mean, I didn't even know some of the stuff that was able to be released through breath work. It's like an hour session where you do different breath patterns specifically for, it's like a quote journey taking the person through it and being there and facilitating it. I still am, you know, my mentor still takes me through sessions and I still, you can laugh, you can cry. It's what your body needs, but when your body it releases it, it, I can't even explain. It's just a sigh of like relief. Mm -hmm. And then it can change everything. Like your the blood, the oxygen level, things that your cells in your body, everything that science, thank gosh, they're doing more scientific stuff. It shows that our bodies do hold on to stuff, even if we don't realize it. And when you allow it to be gone, you come more of like this place of like, I always say, it's like, kind of like after you take a deep breath, like, it's like that feeling of like, mm -hmm. so that's so how you get with clients or I do like groups and facilitate. And it's just amazing to see someone be like, wow, that's what I need. That's, that's what 
I needed to finally feel like I'm, I'm okay. Like, I mean, I was what, seven, six or seven years recovered and I didn't know I had that much crap in me. Mm. So like, tactically, what is it? Is it a pattern of breathing? Mm -hmm. Is it a meditation? Like how tactically, like if you were to fa like facilitate, like what, what do I, if I'm doing breath work, what do I do? So there's breath work because there's the integrative type, which is short. They can be like two, three minute patterns. And I'll you, I mean, most people have heard of like the in through the nose, in for six, hold for seven, and then out for eight. If you're like feeling really stressed out or you're anxious or you're whatever, if you get pissed off, anything, if you do that pattern for a minute, it brings the, you know, like the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, we want that homeostasis. It legitimately brings your body back in to a calm state that can help you for just like in the day there. And then there's different breath patterns mm -hmm. that are done. And I mean, there's so many, like there's like the halo breath, there's like the triactive and it's like, there's so many different patterns. And so what, it, what, how it depends is what are we wanting to work on? Mm -hmm. Like, are you wanting to get into more of a um, calm state? Well, I'm not going to have you be in this like totally hard pattern where we're trying to like release stuff. Yeah. You know, cause it's completely different if we're working on trauma and it's also people don't realize, look at, are you holding a breath? Yeah. I used, to, I used to hold my breath and I had no idea. None. Are you a shallow breather? Most of us are shallow breathers. One of the best things I can give for advice is when you when you breathe or when you're just sitting there, hand on chest, hand on belly. Yeah. You take that breath. See if you're really letting all that air out. Cause I'm telling you, like 90% of us aren't. Yeah. Let that last little bit out. That's when you're gonna like finally see. Oh. And it's definitely not meditation because I can't meditate. <laughs> I gotcha. Okay. Cool. At all. So these last three questions I asked to every guest that joins me on We Are Already Here. This podcast is all about celebrating the lows just as much as the highs in your life. Can you tell me about a struggle that sucked while you were going through it, but looking back now, you celebrate it? What did that struggle give you that you cherish today? For me, it was one of the lowest parts I guess that I realized, I realized it was really bad then, but I didn't understand how hard it was, was when I was halfway across the country in my last treatment center, away from my son again. And he was, I think about five or six. I don't, yeah, five or six. Um, and I had chosen, chosen to get a feeding tube which that is also a misconception. Let me just say, just because I say I got a feeding tube does not mean that I was super, super underweight. Mm -hmm. Just saying that. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people hear, oh, she had a tube. Oh, she must, that or, no. For me, it was, I was not restoring weight, mm -hmm. but enough. I, and I could not eat any more than they wanted me to eat. So I chose for the first time yeah. to get a tube. But- Oof. I had a tube in my nose and I was FaceTiming my son and he was looking at me with, and I thought maybe he wouldn't notice. And he, of course he noticed. And he asked me what was wrong. Like, why do you have that? And I had to sit there and be like, I have a sinus infection. I know I have an mm -hmm. infection. And cause he was really young and yeah. it, and I took, now mind you, I took screenshots and I, at that moment, somewhere I have it posted. And it was me and you could see his little face in the corner and his face like terror. And then he asked if I was going to die. Well, are you going to die? And I was like, this has got to be the worst feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. And I really so hard. badly wanted to get the tube removed. And at that moment, I was like, no. You have to keep it in, Aaron. You have to. Mm -hmm. you have to. And so going through that and keeping the tube in, 
not fighting, restoring the weight was, it was so horrid, like to, to, for me at that moment to be like this, oh my God, I'm choosing to do this. I'm choosing, choosing, choosing. But I look back now and I'm like, thank God, thank God I did it because that for me was the moment I knew I was going to work on my shit. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really hard. It was, it was, it was the hardest, but now looking back, I'm like, that's where I, I began to live. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I chose living over existing. And it's always, it's always rock bottom that makes you do that. Always. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought I'd hit rock bottom before that. <laughs> over and over and over I'd always be like okay this is my I will I will stop I will change I will do it but until I was able to start working on the stuff underneath that was my bottom because that is when I knew I was gonna have to start working on my trauma and mm -hmm. that is what I f the, feared the most that's why yeah. my disorder kept so it was that m point where I was like Buckle my safety belt. Right. Like we're going in. There's, this is it. <laughs> and it was another, you know, two years of recovery, treatment and recovery to work on, on my yeah. stuff. So it's not, it wasn't an easy overnight thing, but. Mm. But you did it. Congrats. Yeah. Wow. Lots of, lots of people with eating disorders don't make it. So yeah, that's yeah. definitely something to be very, very, very proud of and 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 grateful for Ooh, so grateful for my son how have you worked to change how you perceive the world around you and how have you worked to change your thoughts and beliefs into ones that serve you and create a world that you want to live in which I think ties in so beautifully with what you just shared how I feel like I can explain it to people is like I lived in a world of fear mm. I lived in however 20 some odd years in hypervigilant state. I still have a little bit of like the, uh, I get scared a little bit easy, but it's not if someone comes into a room where I jump. Mm -hmm. So I used to be literally like my lens of the world was so scary. I was not, no one, I was not safe. Everything was out to her I was just I was not safe in every aspect and that sounds so, exhausting that oh, sounds so, exhausting and so finally when I started to not be in that hypervigilant state 24 7 that um and I began to recover I started seeing that it was well okay I'm okay mm -hmm. like I it's the the going the from internal sense of safety yeah it was going from the world is scary I'm scary I didn't trust myself I, I did not trust myself at all I would say that to people don't trust me I'm untrustworthy don't know so That's then right. it shifted to this world is in an overall sense is safe in an, in an overall sense but for me it was my environment I was safe mm -hmm. I was okay and now it's that I don't have fear of living. It's completely, completely changed. Yeah. Completely changed. That's, Different. that's a huge shift. This completely. And it's, it's not easy. I always want to say this isn't, this isn't easy, but it's not impossible. Yeah. I mean, if it was easy, everyone would do it and we would all have an internal sense of safety and fulfillment and we would never hurt others because yeah. we would always have that sense of safety in ourselves. But Every single day, people hurt other people, and mm -hmm. that goes to show if it was easy, everyone would do it, and no one would hurt each other, but we're we're not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's worth it. I feel like it's it's worth it. Obviously, it's worth it. Of course. It's worth it. So our final question. Tell me the story that you've created for yourself. Hmm. <laughs> I think... The story I have created and I am creating, I because I like to say I'm ever evolving. I love think, it. You know, we're always going to be evolving. Our cells are evolving. Our, you know, everything is evolving. So what I've created yesterday and the day before is 
going towards it's kind of like this you know we keep going so what i've created for myself is a place of self acceptance self self worth now i've created a place where i know that my son is okay mm -hmm. I, I I know he's okay. I, I always used to think he's not okay. He's not bolts because I wasn't okay. Mm. So he's okay. I'm able to have goals. I'm able to know that my purpose is more than I'm not my eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what I've created is what I always knew I was capable of being. Mm -hmm. I always knew I was something, I was okay. I knew I was okay person, but I just, I was like, but I'm, whore, you know, it was this like double-edged sword. Yeah. But I did have that tiny little thought that I was a good person mm -hmm. or capable. Now I know that. Awesome. And That's I so know, beautiful. I know that, that I, um, there's a purpose for me. I keep going even if things aren't like, yay, because come on, like life is hard sometimes. Totally, it is. Yeah. It's not all great. No, but I and it, and it shouldn't be. It's it wouldn't be normal if it was. Yeah, but I do know that what I went through wouldn't wish that on my just anyone. But I do know that what I went through has made me um, who I am today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Well, Erin, I am so grateful that you joined me today and that we got this chance to chat. Like I said, I've been following you for a while now. So this is just so cool for me. Um, is there anything you want to plug? Is there anything you want to direct my listeners to, to check out anything you're working on or doing? God, I'm, I'm always doing stuff. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always on the move now. Um, no, just, I mean, my Instagram, that's where I hang out. <laughs> that's where I hang out. Um, Perfect. You know? I'll put it in the description. Yeah. Just checking me out. Like, you know, and if I always say my DMs are always open and I mean that because I am like, people say that sometimes, but no, mine really are always like my website. It's that's where I like to tell people, like, if you like my content, you want to read it or you want to check what I do, who I'm about, like what I, what I'm about, what I like, anything. Just go to, you know, my website and I, that's where I like to, um, kind of be like, show who I am and yeah. what I do. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I will put your Instagram and your website in the description of this episode. And thank you for joining me. 